You're listening to the Deerfield Public Library podcast, November 12th, 2020. You know, a video game is just like a book. It's it's a media. It's an artifact. We looked at like a, a video game uh, in a way that we do like a book that has like text, you know, and we can like analyze the text and consume the text. Then I think these conversations would be so much easier. Welcome to the Deerfield Public Library podcast, the podcast of your public library in Deerfield, Illinois, where we talk to authors, artists, and other notable people from our suburb of Deerfield, from Chicagoland, and from the whole world. I'm your host, Dylan Zavagno, the Adult Services Coordinator at the Library, and this month we're honored to have as our guest Dr. Kishana Gray, author most recently of Intersectional Tech, Black Users, and Digital Gaming. Dr. Gray's book tells us that in conversations about racial justice, the world of video games can be overlooked, even though for a lot of people, gaming and related social media are a huge part of their everyday lives. And video games are also a big part of library services. Digital space is real space, says Dr. Gray. It's where hashtags like Black Lives Matter started and where legacies of redlining give way to digital redlining. You'll hear how Black gamers' intersectional identities, race, gender, sexuality, ability, come up against the stereotypical frames and limited narratives offered by the gaming industry and American culture. And yet also how Black users develop self-sustaining, empowering practices, create new resources, and collaborate with allies to navigate digital life. Here's my conversation with Dr. Kishana Gray. I'm here with Dr. Kishana Gray, author most recently of Intersectional Tech, Black Users in Digital Gaming, published this year by Louisiana State University Press, and currently an assistant professor in communication, gender and women's studies, and affiliate in black studies at the University of Illinois at Chicago. Dr. Gray, I'm wondering, uh, for the general non-academic listener, can you just explain the kind of ethnographic critical study you're engaged with in this book? You're incorporating like over a decade of study and interviews with black users um, of video games, but also related media technology. So what does this look like? What are your methods? <laughs> Absolutely. First off, thank you so much for having me. I'm really honored to be here and really honored to share my work, you know, especially to like um, audi- library audiences, right? And I think a lot of folks, you know, don't realize, you know, just how the importance of like importance of libraries are very important to me. And I incorporate, you know, them into like my class, like all the time. So I build in, you know, like into my syllabi, like for students to have to go to the library. Well, now the world's a bit differently, but at least to contact, you know, like their reference librarian, you know, because a lot of folks just think it's easy. Like all I have to do is just do a Google search and then you find I'm like, no, 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 that's <laughs> not how any of this works. You know, so really shout outs to librarians. Um, but I think that, you know, you know, thinking about like information sciences and thinking about like archiving information and curating information and having like data databases. You know, I see the work that I do now. I call myself like a digital her historian, you know, so what I really see is me trying to capture like in the moment, you know, what things that I see are, that are historically significant and allowing folks to like tell their own stories like in their own time, right? You know, so so like for instance, like I didn't go down, I didn't major in history for a particular reason, you know, because whenever I was like, you know, reading like these beautiful stories and hearing these narratives and seeing, you know, the stories that were told, my mind would always go to like, okay, what story is not being told right now? Whose stories are we not getting? And then who decided to like tell the story and like put it together, right? And so I think that there are like particular biases, you know, not, you know, and I don't say that as like, you know, like, bad intentions or anything like that. But, you know, people like, for instance, we could see we could see one event and we can engage in that one event different ways. We interpret it differently, you know, just because of the, you know, our positionality and how we're situated in the world and, you know, the bodies that we're in, you know, whether that's, you know, like race or gender or class identity, you know, abilities, um, disabilities, you know, or sexualities, you know, all those things, you know, have us like perceive the world differently. And so I always I always got like sad whenever I would hear like the stories of, of something. And then I would never, I'm like, well, you know, where were the women at? You know, where were, where were the people of color at? You know, where, you know, what, 
how did we get to this point? And why is this particular person telling the story? So what I see myself doing is like curating and archiving, you know, cultures, especially cultures that want to be curated and archived and cultures that want to be able to tell their own stories. And that's key to intersectionality, you know, because intersectionality is rooted in black feminism, you know, black feminist theory. And a core part of that is self-definition. You know, for instance, you know, black women in particular have spent their entire lives, you know, with other people dictating, you know, their narratives, you know, angry black woman trope, or, you know, even like, um, I'm even thinking about some of the other media stereotypes, like, uh, you know, Mammy or Jezebel or Sapphire, you know, all these different, like, you know, stereotypes of black women. So I love seeing, okay, when black women are in control of their content, what are the stories that they're telling? And and there are beautiful stories of like creating communities, sustaining and nurturing, lifting one another up, you know, saying, hey, OK, the world might be full of, you know, these awful things happening, but we can we'll take care of ourselves and we'll help take care of our communities and we'll take care of other communities, even people who are like not black women. You know, I, I love, you know, the ways that um, there is a particular story I want to share. I'm so sorry if I'm being long winded, Dylan. Please stop me. At <laughs> That's any OK. Time. No, this is all exactly what I wanted you to talk about. <laughs> OK, awesome. There was a particular um, early on, like early in Xbox Live, there were some pretty bad actors in the space, you know, using like a lot of racial slurs, right? Now, the the tendency for some might be to like lash out and say, you know, defend yourself and maybe say say awful things back to that person. There was this group of Black women that were just, that were, were so kind and so generous. And they said, I remember one woman, you know, she said, you know, that he, this guy seems to be having a bad day, you know, and, and, and he, he, there's something, you know, let's not get mad at him, you know, cause he was saying like the N word, you know, calling him like the B word and stuff. So really awful language. And they invited him to like a private space. So in Xbox Live, I guess I can give a context of Xbox Live. So uh, Xbox Live has like private spaces, so private parties. So, uh, so let's say if we're gaming, me and you could go into like a private chat, you know, we could just be in the space just together, right? Um, and so that's what they did. They invited, you know, this guy like in the space and he came in there, he was thinking they were like these black women were gonna cuss him out and they didn't. <laughs> you know, one of the women said, honey, I wanna pray for you. <laughs> it was so that's sweet. <laughs> Said, honey, you know, something's wrong. You, you're lashing out at us. But, you know, you might need a hug. You need something. And, you know, so it was really interesting. Like, like we're friends with this guy to this day. <laughs> that's, that's the wild part. You know, he said, you know, he wasn't, he wasn't, he, he said he wasn't racist, right? And then we had to like explain to him that, you know, what he was doing was engaging in like a racialized racist kind of practice, even if he didn't feel like he was. But, you know, he had to under he, he needed to understand like the legacies that he was like recreating just by the language, the, the his word choice. And to say, you know, he's creating like additional harms or he thinks he's not doing anything but just like trash talking and like just, you know, saying like, you know, bad words. But, you know, there are some people, you know, that could um, that that take that in. And like I'm thinking about just like the daily traumas that a person might experience that could make it worse. And I was like, you know, and I, you know, I really just wanted to get like, you're hurting people's feelings. You know, I really just wanted to just get that simple, you know, just talk about just human emotions. And I think that that's what's so, um, I, I wish we had a lot more of, you know, right now, you know, nowadays, you know, um, um, you know, a lot of people say, you know, we need more like, like civic dialogue, you know, and civil dialogue, whatever, whatever it is. Um, because there's like a lot of, you know, there's not like a lot of, bringing people in to just like listen and like understand like hey we're not each other's enemy we're not each other's combatants we are you know we're given we're we're given an awful deck of cards like an awful hand right you're thinking about like a card game it's an awful hand you know let's just fold this and let's just get like a new set let's just like reset you know so we can start taking care of each other and especially start taking care of like our most marginalized communities so that's what I love about the spaces you know that these that these folks like create in Xbox Live I'll stop there so you can ask your other questions. No, this is great because you're touching on like all of the different things that I hope we would talk about. You know, when I think about libraries, what I'm used to and librarianship is a very white world and there's some amount of activism, not enough, but there's some amount of activism in making inclusive library services, right? Libraries are for everyone. We're going to have inclusive book lists and book discussion choices and displays. Um, but this doesn't often get talked about in video games, even though video games are a huge part of our circulation numbers. And I wonder, why do you think gaming gets kind of taken out of that conversation? I mean, your work is trying to correct that, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. That's a fantastic question. Thank you for asking it. Um, I think too often um, video games gets um, just like situated as like a kid's activity, right? 
and also gets like situated as, um, you know, forgive the use of this word, but like low brow culture, you know, that it's not sure. significant enough for like us to like engage, not not important enough. You know, it's not like, you know, a lot of people look at like a video game and say, well, it's not like cinema. It's not like this, this film. And, you know, so there are like a, a lot of value systems, a lot of valuations that are place devaluations place on video games right um because of and i think a lot of it has to do also with how the media frames um frames it so i'm thinking about like the 90s like i don't think video games have ever really like recovered you know from like the onslaught like hillary clinton you know and you know like she right. she, she was you know, moral combat school shootings or something. yes right. like yeah, yeah, connected yeah. to school shootings and everything and so people you know so video games got like a bad rap right um similar similar to hip-hop you know hip-hop you know got like a bad rap so it's all, always like really interesting just to see how people like will apply like a singular narrative you know to just looking at like video games but I'm I'm fascinated, for instance, like about video games, like in a library context, right? Because like you said, it's like one of the largest things that are, that are like circulated, right? But we don't have like these critical conversations to like actually engage, you know, like a, a lot of these, a lot of the, the content and the world around like video games. And I think that's where, where, you know, librarians could do so much. Um, I, I also, I'm thinking about, you know, you mentioned earlier, you know, about, you know, like the, the whiteness of li- librarians and the libraries, right? And how, you know, like whenever like you want to feature like diverse voices, you have to have like a special class collections and a special box that have come in and like, hey, okay, here's right. our black <laughs> box. Here's our Hispanic heritage box, you know? So it's always like, okay, we exist, but then, then, you know, these other populations are like attachments, right? And I think we have to really like rethink like the culture of that and to think, okay, whose knowledge are we, or do we actually like value, right? And so, you know, and I love that like libraries are doing like the intentional work of being like more inclusive, like just saying, hey, let's feature these voices all year round. You know, you don't have to wait till like Black History Month to like get these like black like authors. And I think that's, that's one of the, like the first steps, right? I think to, 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 to doing that, that kind of like, like inclusive work. Um, video games suffers from like a similar thing, right? You know, so a lot of like the characters are are white, you know, a lot they're created by, you know, white, white men, you know, particularly, you know, are 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 um I think overwhelmingly still like our game developers and designers, secondarily East Asian men. I don't think that there's there's no malintentions. You know, people are just creating the things from the world that they know, right? Which is why, you know, if we have, if most of the authors in the library are white, you know, they're going to tell like white stories and they might not have like the confidence either like to tell another story. Or if they do, you know, could, there could be missteps and, you know, they don't, nobody wants to be in hot water either, you know, from like, you know, telling like a story wrong. You know, so I think that there are just so many overlaps and so many like layers um, because really, you know, a video game is just like a book. It's it's a media. It's an artifact. We looked at like a, a, a video game uh, in a way that we do like a book that has like text, you know, and we can like analyze the text and consume the text. Then I think these conversations would be so much easier, you know, for us to really like engage like video games in a meaningful way. Like you could even have like, um, you know, how people have like book clubs. You can have video game clubs, you know, where you play the game and engage, you know, what you're seeing, you know, so the visual is telling a story. The person that that's behind the scene who wrote the game is adding to that story you know how you market and publish you know the game is telling a story you know so there are many so it's multi-layered stories like with video games I think the nature of the immersiveness of video games adds an, an additional layer so for me like whenever I read you know I'll go ahead and put up my book like if I read like my book for instance right it's it's a it's pre-scripted it's pre-constructed and i can't do anything to alter or amend like the story here right now the thing about video games now although video games are still pre-constructed and pre-scripted it still puts me in control of like a narrative like i can direct the flow i'm a part i'm immersed in it and i think that that's like a cool thing that 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 I, I think that's at the additional layer that's like added that it puts you in the action. Whereas like for me, but when I read, I do this anyway when I read. So let's say, you know, I love like history. <laughs> I love like civil war narratives and everything. So like, you know, I'll put myself like in there, you know, like, oh, I'm this general and do, you know, like, like crazy stuff, you know, so, but not all people like engage with text in that way. Now, you know, I'm an avid reader, you know, I love, you know, I spent days in, in the library. I, if like on my whole summer long, I would just be in like the library, just reading everything that I could. Um, But I think, you know, we, the same kind of narrative could like apply to like video games of how immersive it is and that we might see ourselves in those sto- stories and that, you know, we start to build like narratives like around that. Well, I just wanted to, to connect. You make this, there was this astonishing connection, which is, now visible to me after reading your book where 
you draw a line between like the silent film Birth of a Nation, uh, The Great Gatsby, Tom Buchanan's Fear of Racial Mixing. You know, I'm used to these critiques of the fears um, of whiteness being corrupted in like film or books or, you know, news media. You talk about questions of Obama's legitimacy or something. But then you connect that in one sentence to Sonic Fox and how he came up against the gaming world. So I wonder if you could just briefly talk about who Sonic Fox is and um, how they, you know, came into this kind of whiteness structure and how that relates to intersectionality. Yeah, absolutely. Well, first off, I want to say that I didn't realize that Sonic Fox utilized they, them pronouns at the time where I wrote the book. Um, and so I've always wanted to like, you know, like to issue like a public apology to Sonic Fox, but you know, there's no way for me to get access to them. Um, but so in the book, you know, I'm using, I do, I use, um, I'm misgendering Sonic Fox and I, you know, I want to issue like apologies for that. Um, um, but Sonic Fox was the inspiration for a lot of what I wrote in the, in this book. Right. Um, at the time that I was like writing some of like the chapters, you know, I'm trying to figure out how to bring everything together into like a cohesive whole, right? And then Sonic Fox won like Game Player of the Year, like was awarded like this honor, right? So just to give like a folks like a little bit of background, Sonic Fox um, is a prolific, profound uh, gamer, especially in the fighting scene. You know, so it uh, Sonic Fox is like like um, uh, like <laughs> wins all kinds of tournaments like you know street fighter mortal Kombat, and just does it so effortlessly and with so much grace right um sonic fox won gamer of the year 2016 maybe i can't remember the year but on the cover of espn magazine ninja was elevated as like the face of esports right so these are these two stories that are incongruent for me they're they're inconsistent right and so I had to like engage with that you know for like a little bit I'm like hmm why would gamers overwhelmingly you know select Sonic Fox as like the the person that they are censoring and elevating and then why would like the structure of like ESPN then turn around and give us like a different story so Ninja you know just in case people don't know Ninja um is a very is a controversial figure at best, <laughs> sometimes <laughs> racist and sexist at worst, yeah. right? <laughs> let's, just, let's go ahead and put it out there. Homophobic too, you know, let's go ahead and just, we'll just say all the things, right? I, I feel that there was a particular positioning by ESPN to elevate, you know, a white man as like, you know, like the face of esports, right? And I think that it's just, it's very telling of the larger narrative that they're putting, you know, so they're elevating Ninja as like this universal experience in gaming. But Sonic Fox, let me describe Sonic Fox a little bit. Sonic Fox is a furry, right? Sonic Fox, you know, by, you know has defined themselves as, as a furry. And Sonic Fox has a particular um, particular way of expressing their, um, their Black queer masculinity, right? And I think in a very beautiful, nuanced way, that doesn't fit neatly into the parameters and the structures of sports or esports, which is why ESPN was like, we don't know what to do with this black gay furry. <laughs> so we're just going to do the safe thing and just give everybody this universal experience, give everybody like this white masculine experience. But I think that's that's part of like the story that happens in so many other arenas and spaces, right? Libraries, you know, you know, uh, sports and, you know, academia, you know, we elevate, you know, particular voices over the others, you know, because we have defined white masculinity particular as like the, the default identity to like aspire to, right? But it's this thing that we don't talk about and this thing that we don't say anything about, which is why there are so many particular like um, white masculine anxieties like right now, you know, when, 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 for instance, this particular group of people seeing like Black Lives Matter or see, hey, we got to pay attention to what's happening like at the border. We got to, you know, make sure trans lives, you know, matter. we got to protect these lives. And so this is a population of people that feel like that they're left out not realizing that the world has really like revolved around them for generations and decades and eons, right? And then these are just the people who are just saying, hey, all we want you to do is just acknowledge our lives. We're not asking for anything more than that. Even in the civil rights, you know, movement, folks are just asking for access. Hey, can I just ride this bus to get to work? Not asking for like anything else. Really, it's like basic 
human rights that, you know, like folks are like asking for. But I think what has been constructed is a lot of like entitlement that, you know, there are, you know, some some populations of people who think that the that all the things are there, the jobs are all theirs, the world is theirs, you know, their positions are theirs, the homes are theirs, the loans are theirs, and and the the spots in the school are, are is theirs. And then whenever, you know, we're making space for other people that they feel like something's being taken away. Now that's part of the that's that's the myth of scarcity. And that's also like a condition of capitalism, right? That capitalism will like trick us into thinking that there's only like a few, few, few pies and that we all have to like share capitalism didn't tell us that there's a multitude of pies and capitalism can just make more pies. Um, but, you know, this myth of scarcity really, you know, like pits groups of people together. And, you know, and then we get class warfare. You know, I hate to use, I don't want to use that language, especially right now. So like, we're like on the precursor of, you know, like a lot of this stuff, a lot of folks' anxieties, you know, just kind of seep in. And, you know, and then some people's tendency is to like react and lash out like in violent ways, which is, you know, like very, very sad. Yeah. Well, and you have, I mean, you're sort of leading to this and I, um, cause you have a lot of examples and interviews with people about the exclusion and the racism that black users experience racist language and chats or like the Xbox connect, not seeing black bodies, um, which is like a motion capture thing. Or recently it went around Twitter that the Twitter algorithm was like focusing on white faces. If you posted a photo with a black and a white face. So that's all worth discussing, but you also kind of move away from the disparity model that you call it into seeing like, okay, yes, all of these things are happening and they're real and they have to be discussed. But then, well, just expand on what is that, the the flip that you're making there away from that disparity model? Thank you so much for asking that question. Um There is, you know, and I I think, you know, what you were talking about, you know, the disparity model or the deficit model, um, where we're coming at a lot of, you know, talking about conversations from, um, from, from this deficit or saying, hey, something is missing from our lives and how are we responding and reacting to it? Now, there is a um, a whole genre of scholarship that's called Afro-pessimism that is, um, this is, this is like where, where it comes from, Right. And there's like a battle, you know, between like Afro pessimists and like Afro optimists, right? Right. <laughs> and and I think it's like a fascinating conversation. So you know, Afro pessimists, you know, really see. Um, I think just to, in, in a nutshell, you know, Afro pessimists, you know, really see like the the black experience or the the reality of like black folks or you know or the reality of like brown folks. You know, you have to think about the legacies of like racism and Jim Crow and you know like anti immigration narratives. You know, you have to think about you know what has been the reality of like people you know you know black and brown people like in this world and, and Asian people. So you know like Asian you know a lot of Asian narratives began you know with with like, like for instance like the Chinese you know ch- exploiting Chinese labor and you know ex. Exclu- Including, you know, like um, Asian populations from like the country. So they're saying, okay, so we have experienced all these oppressions and experienced all this stuff. And then so, but look at the amazing, beautiful cultures that have like emanated, you know, from, from that like oppression, right? And so, you know, Afro optimists would say, let's just, let's ignore the rate, not ignore the racism, but let's say, hey, we are more than just what we sprang from, from the plantation. We are more than just like what, you know, like, you know, Jim Crow and, you know, like the era of race riots, like Tulsa's, like all the Tulsa's, like we're more than, we're more than that. We're more than, you know, like these, the civil rights. And we're more than just like struggling and fighting for like our basic rights. Like we have entire lives that are run parallel to this, right? So in the midst, so yes, we could be marching, but we also are just doing a lot of things despite everything that's happening like around us. So I think that's like a really like this beautiful uh, conversation. I want it, hopefully the book accounted for both, right? Um, yeah. So for instance, like I'm in my daily life, you know, I'm not thinking about the world, like what it means to be like a black person in this world or, you know, thinking about being like a mother of black boys or being partnered with a big black man that could go out and be shot on the streets like right now. Right. He just went outside like 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 I, I, I know that that's like in the peripheral. Right. I know that that's happening or even think about, you know, like the brown folks that are like, you know, you know, I spend like a lot of time like in the southwest and like understand, you know, what it means to be like, you know, you know, Mexican and like the Arpaio 
administration in the era where you could just be pulled over and harassed and arrested just because you look Mexican, right? Um, and like the fear of deportation, let's say if you're undocumented, like that's like a daily reality for like a lot of folks. But just think about the beautiful realities that these folks have in spite of that too, right? You know, so I try to like really like account for like, yes, there is like this ever present threat of of deportation or being shot or Karen's calling the police or, you know, like, like that all exists, but we still have so much joy and we still have so much laughter. We still, you know, can experience the world in like beautiful ways that, that, that where that's not a part of like the narrative. And so that's what I, you know, I really wanted to like capture like in this book of like, okay, yes, we've come to these private spaces in Xbox Live because we're experiencing racism and sexism and all that stuff. But when we're in, we're playing the game and we're having fun and we're with other people who support us, you know, whether those other people look like us or not, you know, there are so many like beautiful comrades and allies and accomplices, whatever we're calling, you know, like our, you know, folks these days, you know, so like we, we game with so many like white folks who help are working to help make sure that, you know, our spaces are safe for us too. And that's one of the things that I really wanted to do is like to mobilize and like activate, you know, those kind of like white folks. So for instance, if I go into a gaming space and, you know, like the, I'm, I'm being called like the n-word or something that you know right now i have like white friends that have come in and will like kill all that noise they're like uh uh-uh first off you know kishana you don't have to deal with that we'll protect you we got you we hold you down right and i think that's so beautiful um you know whereas you know because i don't want this you know people to think that you know like this is just you know that 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 like white folks in these spaces are behaving these ways it's very it's far and few between right this is not this is not the common narrative for our gaming experiences. I want people to know that, yes, it's awful when it happens. It's really like ugly and it's hurtful, but that's not what dominates, you know, our gaming experiences like in that space. And so I want to make sure that that folks know that. And I also want to make sure that folks know that they have, you know, I often, I like using like this bystander intervention kind of like models and narratives of like, you know, if, if you see something, say something, like if you hear something, like say something, you know, don't allow like a person like me to just be subject to the, all those kinds of things. Or even if you are, or, um, you know, I had some friends that didn't know what to say or know what to do, you know, because they didn't have like, you know, anti-racist training or, you mm-hmm. know, they didn't know. And I was like, you know, you don't have to. And so I had one friend that would just like, you know, if they would hear something, they would just say, oh, this game is really good. Like they would just like filter in like <laughs> other and, and drown out, you know, the negative stuff, you know, it's a, it's a, and, and not respond, you know, to that stuff as well. So there are so many options, you know, that, that people can do to engage in like that anti-race or anti-racist kind of like uh, uh, practices within within gaming spaces. Yeah, well, and I think maybe um, where at least my mind goes um, as a place where you kind of join those different things is when you talk about the how affirming and generative black women's rage can be and that like the hashtag solidarity is for white women like comes out of Gamergate. And if anyone listening to this doubts the importance of this work, you know, Black Lives Matter started as a hashtag and like in a lot of these social media and gaming spaces. Um, I want you to respond to that, but I also want to also bring in the term digital redlining because I think a lot of our listeners are more familiar with redlining in physical spaces, but one of the themes of your book really is that digital space is real space. So um, that's like two questions at once, but maybe we can (laughs) kind of combine them. Absolutely. I appreciate, uh, I appreciate those questions and that engagement. Um, I remember reading, I think it was in the chapter, me too, me for black women in massage noir. Um, I think there was a quote in there where one of the participants, one of the narrators in the book, she said, if this is, if this is the ghetto, then I'd rather be here or something like that. You know, she really like expressed like, okay, we are here because of this redlining, right? Digital redlining. So, and I use that phrase, you know, because those are redlining is like the intentional structural like barrier that's like put up that like relegates like, you know, potential like, um, uh, you know, basically really it's like, you know, black and brown people to certain neighborhoods. And then they basically, it's really like a net. They really can't get out, right? It's this invisible net where, you know, it's hard to like, like, let's say if you wanted to like, you know, rent an apartment in certain a certain neighborhood, there are some things that are in place that might keep you from doing that rather, you know. Um, and there's also like these new algorithms like that. So for instance, my name is Kishana. 
So there's an algorithm that will like flood their, their um, so let's say they'll put my information into the computer and then every name that has like, like K-I-S-H will like populate. So all of the people who have good credit and bad credit, if there are too many like results, then that could be like a reason that I wouldn't get an apartment. They will say, you know, it's not clear enough of like a story or narrative. So the algorithm is like dictating a lot of things. So that's some more of another yeah. example of digital redline. But, but anyway, so in, in thinking about like the digital space, you know, we self-segregated because of a lot of the, awfulness that was happening in like those the main lobby areas like the main gaming spaces and I think that some folks who are gaming they probably don't understand that so people just think that you're just playing a game and you're just like like in a Mario world like games are totally different so for instance like um you know just so people can get a sense of of what what it means let's me and you we could be on PlayStation or Xbox or whatever we're playing and we could be connected to like thousands of people across the world, right? Millions of people like across the world. And then we'll be in a gang space. Let's say it's me, you, and 10 other people, right? So five of us on one team, five on another team. Like the communities are voice-based, um, heavily voice-based. So a lot of people think that you're just like typing on like a keyboard. Consoles, you know, like we don't, our, our go-to is not the keyboard, right? Our go-to is like a being, putting headphones on and talking to somebody like through, through a mic. So it's like this linguistic profiling that's happening um, just so people can understand. So we can hear how each other sounds in the space. So you can hear if somebody sounds black or you can hear if somebody is speaking English with an accent or if you can hear somebody speaking another language. And then the space has, you know, I call it the, like the, the default gamer. The default gamer has been constructed and cast as, you know, a standard American English speaking, maybe white guy, right? You may be like, maybe ad- adolescent, you know, or teens, maybe in some spaces. Um, so whenever you hear the presence of these other folks, then people like lash out in particular ways. So that kind of like pushed us like to the margins of where we're just playing in these private spaces. So that's, and then because the system never like did anything really to combat that, it just says, oh, you can mute, you can block, you could do, you do these things, but they were never intending on fixing like that, that space. Um, and so that led, led to the redlining that led to the ghettoization of, of gaming spaces. Um, because it wasn't safe enough. It wasn't constructed and wasn't for me. Um, and so, and I think that that's kind of like, um, I missed the second part, the first part of the question I think I missed, you know, when I, when you said redlining, I think I went straight to redlining. Yeah, but it's, it's all related. I think is that talking about then black rage being a generative space that maybe comes out of those, those segregated places. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I love, so we would often be angry and lash out like in particular ways in those spaces. And, and I think, you know, whenever, you know, when black, black women's rage is always like dismissed as something that's not important, not generative. Right. Because a lot of people just lump this, this identity of like angry black woman on that. And they're like, Oh, she's angry. Oh, she's mad. But we never ask the question of why, why is she angry? Why is she mad? Where we allow men in particular to be like angry and to be mad. And I, this is Audrey Lord's work. Audrey Lord's work is so fascinating, so beautiful. Um, Audrey Lord was writing in a particular time. I think it was like, um, maybe like the wars of like the eighties. I, I don't know, but, but, but when she was writing, um, she had made the comment of like, you know, we are, you can see the rage of like American um, American identity, American military across the world. Like we're angry and the anger is grenades and missiles and ammo, right? And like we never like interrogate, you know, like the rage of, of that because that that particular rage is rooted in um, um, uh, like masculinity, military industrial complex of where it's like it's that's the rage that like sustains like a particular identity and a narrative of, of our country. But on the flip side, You know, let's say like black women, like in particular, like rage could come from the like structural inequalities. Rage can come from like the death of our, you know, our children are dying and rage can come from like our our, uh, impoverished conditions. And, you know, it could come from all these kinds of things. And like we're angry and going to the streets and getting people to like pay attention. And then that nobody's listening. And so we up the ante, you know, Tupac really, you know, gave like a really there's an interview Tupac gave, I think, to MTV where he was trying to talk about, you know, like black anger and black rage. And he's saying, you know, we're just knocking on the door. We want you to listen, we want you to hear. And then all of a sudden that like escalates. It's like, okay, we're just busting it down. You know, we're going to make you hear. And I think that that's like a good way to like understand a lot of the uprisings, uh, uprisings and the rebellions that are like happening, you know, where people might think that they, what they're seeing is like looting. Um, but you know, b- but there's, you have to understand that for like a 
a group of people who don't have power, don't have any other like recourse, can't get access to like people in positions of power because they don't listen. You know, there's there's a way there's a there's there's steps where we're like, okay, we just got to burn it down. You know, we just got that. And then that's what happens, whether, you know, like folks like agree or not. Like, that's just what the human condition is going to do. The human condition is going to be like, okay, you're not listening. So let's just do violence. And I don't know why people don't understand. Like America, we're a very violent country. Like when we get upset, we fight. Like that's, I mean, people don't think twice when it's like, okay, well, we got to go fight in these wars. We got to go bomb them. We got to go do that. That's like the template that America gave us. So we're just expressing our American rights to be violent. <laughs> it's so awful. I don't, I don't want to say that like, <laughs> just, just like that. Like I, I don't, I'm, I'm not an advocate of like violence. I'm, you know, I'm, I very much, have, you know, I'm in the nonviolent um, realm. Um, but, but I all, I never want to dismiss people. I try to understand why, you know, like what is happening? What, what is it? What is it that we need to pay attention to? Like in, in this moment um, and in so many populations, especially right now, you know, black folks just aren't getting like the benefit of, of, of people who are trying to say, Hey, why are you all doing this? And that's, that's really sad. Yeah. Well, and I, you know, it's um, a leap maybe to be talking about um, uprisings and then talking about Wi-Fi, but I, I have heard you address in Chicago specifically there's digital redlining with just Wi-Fi access and um, Pokemon Go stops even. You know, our library up in the North Shore was a Pokemon Go stop, and we're really proud of that. But there were not Pokemon Go stops on the South Side. <laughs> and that's one, that's another example of, you know, this like this redlining um, of how red, redlining influences like gaming spaces and gaming practices, right? You know, because if we didn't have like redlining, then we would have, we would have not really thought about, you know, like the, the, the distribution of like pokey stops like across the city then, right? But, but because we do have redlining, you know, then we think about like the spaces that are safe and accessible. Because you know, I remember trying to get like a pokey go stop like on the south side, you know, people were like, well, there aren't that many sidewalks and the neighborhood's like not safe. It's not constructed as safe. And, you know, that was um, and so but that just go- feeds into like this particular narrative of um, of of what it means uh, of what they would accept, you know, And the fact that they have like devalued like so many like neighborhoods, like on the South side and the West side, you know, that's just like feeding into it. And I think it's important for like a company like Niantic to like push back against that and say, you know, because there are so many kids down, you know, down the South side that want to play. And then we have to like, you know, show like the value of like neighborhoods, you know, just to get like a pokey go stop. So I think that that's I'm glad you brought that up. That's a huge, that's a huge point and a huge component. it's, It's that same logic, right. Of not looking at why there might not be sidewalks or something. Thing, right oh absolutely <laughs> because you need funding for sidewalks right like and that's like, and all so comes you from it. property taxes and redlining and all that stuff yeah absolutely layers there's layers <laughs> to this, right and i think you know pokemon go really just like highlights all of that you know the things that we don't want to talk about you know yeah fantastic point fantastic all right point. well I, we we should wrap up here but one library thing that i have to mention um for parents teachers other library professionals that um, I already emailed everybody <laughs> is can I play that.com is such a useful resource. And I thought maybe you could just tell us because that's another aspect um, ability um, with intersectionality that we haven't really addressed. So just tell us about can I play that.com. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And I know we're winding down and running out of time, but can I play that is a beautiful resource for folks who have, um, who have, uh, uh, who have disabilities or different abilities, you know, however you, however you want to like frame it. And, and so like, for instance, like for, for a person like me, I'm an able body person. I don't have to think twice when it comes to like playing a game, right? I don't have to think through like, will I be able to play that? Can I play that? I can just grab a controller and I can just play. You know, I'm, I'm, I have a norm, I have a level of hearing where, you know, I don't need accommodations. You know, I, I have a level of vision where I don't need, I have my glasses. I do have an accommodation for that, but you know, I'm able to like, you know, see. Um, and so, but we have to think about not, not everybody engages like that. Not every, some people have different levels of hearing, different levels, different use of their hands. Um, I'm even thinking about like whenever I had like visitors to the, to my gaming lab, um, there were folks who, who, um, 
communicate it using sign language. And then I gave, I gave these folks like controllers and that took away like their ability to communicate. Like to me, I, I was horrified thinking about this level of violence that I did to them today. It's like silencing them. Right. And of course, you know, they were like, no, Kishala, don't worry about it. You know, they, they may want to make me to feel better, but that's, you know, we shifted over to like the connect because it was more, they were able to use their bodies and they were able to keep their hands free so they can sign and so they could c- communicate. And, and um, I remember talking a few weeks ago to the quad gods, you know, so these are folks who are quadriplegic. And so they have different use of their hands, probably very let very little use of their hands. And, you know, so a lot of them were like engaging games differently. So they'll buy a console and have to get modified controllers. They'll have to like put in like different codes to be able to use kinds of uh, different kinds of things. So even just the cost to make things accessible is so steep. And this is like, this is a huge exclusionary practice, but can I play that is an amazing resource. So before you go and buy games, you know, you say, okay, um, do they have captions? Will I be able to to engage it? Will I will I be able to see it? Are the is the font big enough? And I think it's a really useful, um, really useful like resource. So shout outs to Can I Play That. Thank you so much, Dylan, for for shouting them out. Awesome. Um, so I thought we would just end. I mean, obviously you're engaged in a critical study in your book, Intersectional Tech, but you are a gamer. So just for you know, we always love giving recommendations at the library. So any games that you can recommend? Yes. Oh, goodness. So, I always, <laughs> so this is hard. This is tough, right? You know, because games do different things for different reasons and different purposes, right? So if there is like a game for like communal engagement, um, you know, I would say like a game like Fall Guys, or um, Among Us, you know, those are beautiful, like communal kinds of games where you just play and have fun with other people. And if you want to do things communally, but be task oriented, like a more better task, I would say Overcooked. Now, everybody's not equipped for Overcooked, you know, because there's, there's like a, the, the stress level of cooking and preparing food <laughs> can be very stressful, especially under in, 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 you have to do it like under pressure in a particular time. Um, a single engage a game that I think is like beautiful to allow you to just like engage individually. You want a beautiful like visual experience. You want a, a nice sonic experience where it sounds good and it's like crisp. Mm. It would be Hitman. <laughs> Okay. Um, I love, I love Hitman. I love the Hitman series. Like the worlds that they create are just so beautiful. Like I can just go and like just see and just be in like these beautiful spaces and landscapes. Um, I'm trying to think about like other kinds of genres of games. Like if you want to just like have fun with your kids and just like press a button and you don't have to really do anything, Roblox will be that okay. game. Like just go and jump in a room in Roblox. <laughs> And especially, especially if you don't really know how to play games, you can just go on there and probably push like the X button and then things that happen and you'll be just fine. <laughs> That's perfect. Uh, well, thank you so much, Dr. Gray, for your time and uh, sharing your work with us. I'm, I'm really hoping more people hear about it and, and sit with it and engage with it. Thank you, Dylan. I appreciate you for having me. You can find out more about Dr. Gray's work at KishanaGray.com or her Twitter is at Kishana Gray. Links are in our show notes and blog post. And you can also check out Intersectional Tech, Black Users in Digital Gaming here at the library in our podcast collection, which features books and other media from our past guests. That's our show. Special thanks to Dr. Gray for taking the time to talk with us. And a special thank you to librarian Stevie Noguchi, who helped make this possible. And thank you for listening to our 44th episode. This is the end of our fourth year. I can't believe it. And we're taking December off. So we'll see you next year when we talk to more amazing guests from around Deerfield, Chicagoland, and the whole world. Comments and feedback are always welcome and can be sent to podcast at deerfieldlibrary.org. Go to deerfieldlibrary.org slash podcast to learn more about our show and find links to subscribe. You can also follow the library on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or check out our YouTube channel. Links are on our website or in the show notes. We'll be back next year. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.